Subtext and Discourse, a podcast featuring conversations with a range of art world participants who share their unique experiences and insights to this famously opaque field. My name is Michael Dooney, director of Jarvis Dooney Gallery and host of the show. This episode was recorded in London at the home of Michael Barnett, aka The Arty Gent. Michael is the arts feature writer for State F22 magazine and special projects lead at ARP's Bermondsey Project Space. He's a salon organiser for Arty Party and Karma Basement, and as I discovered during our interview, the first curator at sea for the Sea Spirit of Discovery Saga cruise ships. Michael has led a very interesting life, which began in the east end of London in the 1960s and continues to this day. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy my conversation with the arty gent, Michael Barnett. I remember we met at, I think we were at an opening during Photo London. Yes. That's where afterwards you said, oh, you should come to Bermondsey. Project space. It's, which is, for, for people that don't know that, it, it, it's a uh, gallery, so we will just re- refer to it as Bermondsey pro- Project Space. Mm-hmm. It's three floors, three galleries, approximately 3,000 square feet in Bermondsey Street, London, SE1, which is, for people listening outside of London and outside of England, that is close to Tower Bridge and very close at the time of speaking to where the Mayor of London works. And is that connected to State Magazine or newspaper? State F22 is an art and photography magazine. Mm -hmm. It's free and it survives on advertising and sponsorship and it's in two halves. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm the editor at large. The main editor is a gentleman called Mike Von Joel. So it's not to be confused between uh, Michael Barnett, which is me, and the other gentleman called Mike Von Joel, who's the editor. And Mike has been in the business for, you know, well over 30 years. And I first got to know State 22 before... I got involved in it. It used to come in two separate halves. So you have arts, one half, and then uh, photography, the second half. Mm -hmm. So those are two big projects, I guess, that you're involved with. You also refer to yourself as the arty gent. Arty gent, yes. With um, your other activities. How did you get started? Where do you want me to start from? I mean... Did you study art? Were you a photographer? Were you kind of involved in any scene? I went to sort of like, I suppose, state schools. I always had a an area of what would be termed later, I suppose, as creative thinking, although mm-hmm. I didn't know what it was. And then I was born in East London, in Hackney, which has become, as far as London is concerned, very, very trendy. But when I was living there, it wasn't poor, but it was a completely different area. And some parts of it could be considered as rough because there was gangs and different things going on and then how long ago just to give a time frame, uh, like the 70s yeah 70s late 60s and then one day i can't actually remember but everybody in the world knows a department store called harrods mm-hmm. and upstairs in harrods on the fifth floor there was a boutique called way in it doesn't exist now but it, it was quite cutting edge extremely cutting edge and for whatever reason i went up there as a sort of 17 year old coming from hackney and i asked for a job like oliver can i have some more yeah. food and i was interviewed by the general manager and cut a long story short I got a job. There wasn't a vacancy, but they employed me. And so I took the 30 bus, which was probably the Route Master Red bus that the world knows from Hackney to Knightsbridge, which is a great leap worlds from the East End. And in way in, every single celebrity came to visit because it, there wasn't anything like way in. I mean, I can remember people like Phil Spector came, Orson Wells, Tony Curtis many many rock stars Mm -hmm. i was in way in for about two years and was subjected in the nicest possible way to debutantes lord ladies creative people people who had who had some spark about them or that that they had a way about them a world that i i didn't know and i it grew from there it was like a springboard to my life and then from there because that was a couple of years, you only did that in mm-hmm. sales, you know, young person in sales. So I only did that for a couple of years. And then there was an advertisement in the Evening Standard, which is the London paper. There was the Evening News and the Evening Standard uh, in the BBC for accounts. 
And I remember because I liked fashion, I put on a bow tie and a very lovely shirt and looked pretty good. And I went for an interview and it was surprising because I had no real qualifications. I got Mm -hmm. the job in BBC accounts and I worked in the BBC for 20 years. And that is another creative uh, side to it. And in those days, you could get something called an attachment. And so I went to program planning, to current affairs. There was an element called Open University, which has gone on to greater things. And so I did many, many things in the BBC. And and within that time, uh, I was one of the founders of a theatre in the King's Road 352 called The Man in the Moon. And this was a fringe theatre. And the theatre opened with a really classic play called Clockwork Orange and Clockwork Orange was written by Anthony Burgess and it was banned as a film at that Mm -hmm. time and also it had never been a play and an unknown director who is quite famous but not so at the time of speaking is John Gobber. John Gobber was from the Howl Track Company and he, he produced Jumpers and Bouncers which were plays that went on to greater esteem. So we opened with Clockwork Orange, which was performed by the Yorkshire Players. And how we did that was that not myself, but people in the theatre wrote to Anthony Burgess. Mm -hmm. Because we were in the BBC, we had contacts. It was quite easy to figure out who was his agent. And they wrote and wrote and wrote. And I I don't know where this postcard is now, but Anthony... Uh, sent us a, a card saying you can do what you like with it as long as you bloody well leave me alone. <laughs> uh, and that's and that that sounds like Michael Caine will blow the bloody doors off. So we put the uh, play on. That was the first play we started with and there was queues around the doors. There was like front page mm-hmm. time out. And uh, we put on plays like Steam Room, which uh, was quite controversial. There, were, there was a number of plays. So I didn't deal with the play side but from from there i started to put on cabarets Mm -hmm. so you were more involved with booking or no no i I was dealing with things that weren't plays so i was dealing with Ah, sponsorship cabaret i was the first person to i came up with a really wacky idea at the time and again this is to do with english british television because i know your podcast goes around the world so Mm -hmm. it was called breakfast uh, time and and this was very very new the program because in England we it, it takes us a decade before we could even start thinking where the project was at the time so breakfast television was very very new and I came up with this idea that we put breakfast theatre mm-hmm. and we sent it out and Capital Radio which is a completely different radio station now picked it up and we p- performed breakfast theatre on the uh, radio at, at the th- theatre and of course at sort of nine o'clock in the morning there wasn't an audience but you but you did it as we were doing now it was yeah. just a sort of an, an audio thing so I dealt with things like that there was comedy it was called in, in the way that language goes language has completely changed because cabaret became cabaret but it was alternative comedy mm-hmm. which was uh, featured in time out and how they used to put the uh, listings in so there was people com- coming up like rory bremler julian clary jenny eclair i mean that type of comedian who went on to much wider acclaim and i used to put the cabaret on there and i used in the king's road which is a really funky place to act to actually be there was a place around the corner called crazy larry's and Mm -hmm. crazy larry's was in a place called lots road and lots road was uh, king's road very very trendy and a bit sort of wild and i put on a cabaret called mad max that was in conjunction with max langdown who i put it on with him and at that time you're too young, Michael. But at that time, the pubs, they were on a Sunday, past the, they closed early. So Terry, who was the manager of Crazy Larry's, I think he was the owner, thought it was a good idea. So we put Cabaret on in Crazy Larry's. And because that was the only place you could get a drink on a Sunday, it, it was quite packed and it yeah. was packed for whatever reason. It was, we got a, a big proportion of gangsters. I mean, I mean, real 
Really? Gang- okay. Yep, real gangsters because I didn't know them, but they used to hang out in that part of the world. One gangster who is world famous, he's dead now, so we can mention his his name, is called Johnny Binden. And Johnny Binden is, is, is famous because his relationship with Princess Margaret. But Johnny Binden used to come to Crazy Larry's virtually every week. Mm-hmm. And I used to tell the people who were taking the money that if any of these people didn't want to pay, just let them in because it wasn't worth the hustle. But they all paid. And I haven't thought about this in a a long time, but it is quite surreal. And for those of you who don't know the comedians' names, it's maybe difficult to imagine. But you've got these guys who were real gangsters. They weren't muck-around gangsters. They were the real McCoy, very, very kosher gangsters. And they were hearing things that in today's world would be cutting edge. They'd be hearing cutting edge comedy mm-hmm. that even I could, you know, you, it, it's sort of like Julian Clary at the time, his wit was razor sharp and he could take the mickey out of any, anybody. Yeah. So it was, you've got people who have come from completely different. They're there for a drink. They're mm-hmm. not there. Yeah, exactly. So it was, it, 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 it was quite an interesting time and, and that closed because at one time there was a reporter from the stage who his name we're going to leave out mm-hmm. but he threw for whatever reason a glass of wine over Johnny Binden's girlfriend and that is something that you don't do I don't know how it happened Johnny Binden went berserk this was in the middle of a cabaret of, of, of a comedian uh, mm-hmm. performing. He went in the middle. He got hold of this reporter who was quite small and picked him up by his mouth and he just had him in his mouth. We all froze and Terry, who knew Binden, saved this man's life by just going to him and tapping him on the shoulder and saying he's not worth it. The man... This reporter dropped down. He wasn't killed or anything, but what it did, it killed our show because although it wasn't in the papers Mm. or whatever, the the performers wouldn't come back. The audience didn't come back. The the, the gangsters didn't come back. And so Mad Mad Max finished at that Mm. time. I was working at the BBC and then I got headhunted by Polygram Music Video and I was dealing with the film and and video of Polygram's output for the whole of England and Europe and I I centralised it. So what that did was it put me in a record company environment which uh, was very interesting. There was lots of parties. Uh, You got tickets for all the major gigs and festivals and it opened up a a different area and this is where we link into the art side and then at that time obviously there was the man in the moon theater and there Mm -hmm. was a club that's still there called raffles i was in this club which is quite an upmarket and trendy club i can't remember why and this lady called georgina brunei who is no longer with us came up to me i knew her vaguely and uh, she said to me you're arty aren't you and i said yes (laughs) <laughs> and she said, would you like to write for a, a magazine? And I said, okay. And at that time, I, 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 apart from writing uh, management things or sort of mm-hmm. reports or whatever it is, I hadn't really written creatively. And Georgina pr- produced this magazine, which is, uh, is on the internet to this day. The magazine doesn't exist, but mm-hmm. it was the first only internet magazine it was called hot gossip Mm -hmm. and people used to get confused with the name because there was a band called hot gossip which sarah brightman was in which Mm -hmm. was andrew lloyd webber's one one of his wives but it was called hot gossip it was the first ever internet magazine so i i I wrote on the arts it it was kind of like freelance but it maybe wasn't called freelance then Mm -hmm. and there was a lot less freelancers so i got to travel to a fair bit of the world, uh, went to all these events and I was writing about shows and having to use my creativity. Mm-hmm. Um, what I would say to anybody listening to this, creativity, if it makes sense, isn't just about 
being creative because if you say you know I'm, I'm making this lovely drawing or this photograph creativity mm. could be something that is very domestic but you put it in a different way and for people like myself who didn't necessarily have a schooling mm -hmm. or a study in the arts or the creative world you still have this creativity in you but you don't know what it is until it comes out in a different way and then gradually the word being creative and, and the arts you can be creative but in different ways and you are creative but you're just not called a creative person but yeah. within me i found that i had the ability to speak to people to listen to people and um, it was very interesting hearing what people did in the arts uh, the photography architecture all different things and you had to come up nobody gives you anything for nothing and if you're going to do something you have to bring something to the party mm -hmm. so you have to come up with your own ideas in today's world it, it will probably mean you have to pitch it because people want to know what you're doing so yeah. i was doing hot, hot gossip and hot, hot gossip was also put together with a lady who sadly isn't with us called sally farmelow And Sally Farmlow was notorious because I think she had an affair with Geoffrey Archer, Lord Lord Archer. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if he's still a lord <laughs> now, but she she was well known for that. But uh, Sally Farmlow was very entrepreneurial lady. So, and there was also a gentleman called Nick Pope, and Nick Pope uh, worked for the government, and he his area for the government was in extraterrestrial you know what was going on in the uh, skies there, there was a department there where they employ p people to find out what's really going on so he was also part of this so i was again with, with 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 my life i was mixing with different types of people and working with them but this time within the art world and this went on for a long time do you think it was a natural transition for you from when you were at the department store in harrods to doing the theatre work and then doing the radio work, being in in the art world, so to say, it was like a natural evolution just because of not necessarily the output, but maybe the mentality and the way that people think about approaching things. Well, what I would say is that I don't necessarily look it, but I'm the sort of person, if you, are, if you ask me to do something, I would say yes and work out sort of how to do it later and if i couldn't do it i would i would get back to you you know if if, if they're in those split seconds if, if mm -hmm. you're given an opportunity it's just like when john lennon met yoko oko y yoko ono that's a good we should keep that in yoko <laughs> oko uh it's because he said yes and i do have that element within me i i, I would say yes and then i was at the royal academy and i knew mike von joel Mm -hmm. through the art world and mike said the same thing to me as georgina he said you you write and i said yes which at that time i i did because i've been doing hot, hot gossip but hot mm -hmm. gossip would finish but I'd, i i had the experience and then the first article i wrote for state was on the it, it's on at the haywood the uh i can't think of the name of it it's called like British art and it, it it's it's every so many years and it travels around England and mm -hmm. I, I I did that and the first artist that I did proper was a lady called Lucy Sparrow who knits different objects she was she was unknown at the time and she had a, a shop which was like a pop-up shop in East London which my daughter Olivia alerted me and i went and saw her exhibition and it had all sweets and newspapers and dads and everything you could think of but they were all like sort of knitted and put together with fabric oh, wow. and i okay. thought she'd be a wonderful person to interview so she she was my first and that was my first cover with state f 2022 and then what happened from there unbeknown to, to me mike was getting to, together Bermondsey project space mm -hmm. which opened about a couple of years afterwards and Bermondsey project space is a not-for-profit gallery mm -hmm. which is a very good model because we, we've been there for about seven years how it works it's that it's a collaboration with artists or countries or sometimes you get companies who want to promote art but from an artist or a photographer's point of view when the work is sold the artist gets to keep all the 
profit. Mm-hmm. And in this day day and age, that model is is working a lot better than some of the more commercial galleries because what with the pandemic and the different financial areas, depending the level of art that you're selling. Obviously, if you're selling art for millions and millions mm-hmm. of pounds, the people who are buying that art is not a problem. You know, yeah. they're going to buy it. But for middle art, you know, £500, £5,000, £10,000, budgets have become strained. So that area is really, really tough and not all the galleries have got clientele that are continually buying. Mm-hmm. So with Bermondsey then, being a non-for-profit, how is it funded? Because if you're not taking a commission on sales from the artists, how do you... Well, it, 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 it's funded through, sometimes there's spon- spon- sponsorship of people. Pe- people mm-hmm. sometimes sponsor the gallery. But, but basically it works because there is a, a weekly rate Mm-hmm. And and that weekly rate covers the uh, out outgoings. Do you curate the space then? Like, can anybody present at Bermondsey? Uh, no. Or is there a kind of a selection? There must still be a selection. Yeah, we process. we we've got a gallery director called and Andrew, and he, mm-hmm. he 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 runs the space. And and obviously, if if it's a mutual thing, I mean, p- people may come to the gallery and they see it on paper, and then they don't like the space, mm-hmm. so they say no. Or they might love the space and the gallery will look at the artwork and say, well, the, the, the artwork isn't for us. So mm-hmm. it's a 50-50 collaboration. I mean, they, they won't put on work that they don't like. Yeah. So I guess the trade-off of hiring the space or paying to use the facilities is a trade-off against potential sales. To the artists. And, and the amazing thing is, if, if, it, if it is amazing, is that you get instances where people are having an exhibition and they're not selling the work. Mm-hmm. Which is more common than not. <laughs> well, I mean, we, 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 we did uh, a project with Ke- Ke- Keone where, for, for instance, the, the company, we, we didn't put this project two together, but they mm-hmm. found the gallery. So you'd have a situation, it's a good example of business and art galleries, and especially a not-for-profit gallery, mm-hmm. where a company had a photographer and they went on a trip to in India and it was about teaching uh, passengers guess how to f- photograph not at a professional level so mm-hmm. small group go out there they do it so that they they had the pictures and then they were looking for a gallery so they mm-hmm. come to a gallery like Bermondsey Pro- project space it's not for profit it's not a co- commercial gallery mm-hmm. they can put the the exhibition they bring their sort of clients passengers you can get the exhibition reviewed and you can have a private view Mm -hmm. and it's about i I, i'm just assuming for that company to promote the holiday company you you also get countries where they want to promote a certain art Mm -hmm. i mean this is a few years ago where canada in in the canadian embassy had an exhibition of women artists who were portraying women in a contemporary way but it's very hard i mean it it was open to the public but Mm -hmm. you have to go through security and all these things and they wanted a place where they could make it more open to the public oh right so so they came to bermondsey project space and you put it on and that is a way of promoting the Mm -hmm. country promoting the artists there's no fee for coming in. And also Bermondsey Project Space in its first three years of life was sponsored by Olympus, the oh, okay, camera yeah, firm. The camera company. And the interesting thing about that sponsorship was that it wasn't uh, focused on f- photography because mm-hmm. Olympus wanted to be a hub and still, and still is a hub. So they, they would have painters, photography, sculpture. And it was a way of sponsoring the arts their logo wasn't particularly huge and it was a way of saying we're going to encourage art and at that time the exhibitions weren't particularly focused on selling Mm -hmm. so there are ways of incorporating arts into a not-for-profit situation that works for everybody Mm -hmm. i guess it's quite a contrast working and running a project space than it is if you've got a kind of commercially focused gallery it must be quite nice doing more socially minded exhibitions and ones that aren't necessarily tied to high financial outcomes that you can actually show work that needs a place to be presented. 
It is that because the the my understanding of the gallery, although there are perimeters and variations, is that the gallery can offer artists who are not necessarily household names. I know that Mike's one of the things is about putting artists' work to the wider public who have maybe been over- overlooked. Because although there's a lot of famous artists or people know, there's there's maybe thousands of artists that are equivalent quality that are completely o- overlooked. Mm-hmm. And Mike has been in, in, in the art world for, you know, 30, th- th- 35 years and has, has come across many, many artists. So I'm sure there's been, over the period in the gallery, many goodwill gestures to, to put... Um, artists that would normally get a show but I, I, I would emphasize that in doing that it's the individual quality of the work if i just step outside of Bermondsey project space and looking in you know it, it's a way of putting something back into the arts because we've also had sort of readings and mm-hmm. mu- musicians and different things where it's financially workable not necessarily in a selling area where selling is is the main thing i do understand because art is a product if you don't sell it Mm -hmm. you know for for the people who who need to survive you you do need to sell it but for a lot of people they also need springboards where your art although it it is changing because we've got the interesting situation of online Mm -hmm. we've got the nfts which is another area how younger people view art because with the pandemic we've just had a lot of art by younger people has been bought online Mm -hmm. also within the uh, not-for-profit world and the and the models for galleries i mean i'm sure you've noticed that a lot of galleries names that Mm -hmm. we know their names but they aren't actually bricks and mortar anymore no so they've been put into an area of maybe going to art fairs which which has changed or maybe it's by appointment to their homes Mm -hmm. so you know there's no doubt about it that the art world is changing and nothing ever ever stands still so the way that we are viewing art galleries the way people buy art and what the future is art because we've seen some huge sales in digital art that younger people may view going to the gallery in it in a completely different way in the future. Yeah. I mean, have you seen much of a change or an evolution in audiences and demographics? Yeah. Not just, I suppose, at Bermondsey, but going out to galleries and to exhibitions, just the shift in clientele and also how it's changed generationally, even overlooking the pandemic and kind of the rupture that's happened. How have you felt about the changes? I think there's two changes if, if they can be put in two halves mm-hmm. we'll deal with the glamorous mm-hmm. side first because the glamorous side is that the art and, and young people going to galleries is still there i think the nfts are bringing different people into the galleries but a, a lot of the people who are coming into the galleries if it's not veering off too much and, and please t- tell me, is is that they're going to galleries, but they're also people who look at clothes and, and when they go to galleries, how they look, how they dress, mm-hmm. what they eat, what films, what books they read. A big percentage of those demographics are engaging with arts and they're used to going to galleries or their parents had, had taken to galleries. Certain get- galleries have become younger. Obviously, there's, there's different... I mean, the East End, which is changing as, as we speak has been more gentrified is obviously bringing in more of a younger element but i mean our artists di- 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 different artists bring in different demographics and some artists bringing demographics you know across the board mm-hmm. but the other area which is still important and you know i haven't got any data on on, on this is that you've got people who going into a gallery is like dare i say it like brexit and they try and say like project fear because they they're not used to going into galleries and they're put off by going into galleries i mean we did this project called my street my house my home it was sponsored by olympus and we went Mm -hmm. to all saviors school and they were teenagers 
studying for in photography for their er, er exams and, and we did this project in one month and from memory i think we sent a photographer called ed, ed sykes who's a well-known photographer and he went to sort of teach them and they sent their work in mm-hmm. and i wasn't involved in the judging but from my knowledge the judges weren't told about what work they were looking at what age group they were looking oh, at okay yeah and they judged it oh this is good this is good it's not good good did do, do, do and there were an olympus bless their cotton socks olympus uh they get there were three prizes well worth having like cameras of different yeah. uh, di- different levels and when they found out that these people were 16 17 they they were kind of like shocked the quality of the work yeah and well. i i remember the headmaster said that they'd improved in one month just how having the going out and having a bit of tuition. But what happened was we had a private view mm-hmm. and the parents were involved. Uh, you invited the parents and the children. And some parents, you know, were anti coming into the gallery or they or they, their body language was, they, it isn't part of their life. Really? Wow, okay. It's like, you know, some people going into life is going into a pub and some people it's never been part of their life. So, And there was one parent who really didn't like their child being involved in the project, didn't like their child going into arts. So there's this whole swathe of people where actually engaging with arts is different. It's it's different, say, engaging with putting a thing on the television it's a, a video game or playing mm-hmm. around with your iphone samson or whatever make a phone you you've got and actually sort of going into a, a, a gallery and l- looking at the art looking at the photographs looking at sculpture and not being used to going in there is a fear f- f- factor mm-hmm. and maybe that is because of you know the the diversity of education and, and and although i'm well past being in, in, involved in that my, my, myself from a parental point of view you know the the arts and the creative side are being cut out of our the schools it's not mm-hmm. part of the curriculum oh you think that contributes to this i'm not a part of that I yeah be involved with that yeah well we've got we, we, we've got this dichotomy of sort of you've got all the cutting edge and everybody has got access or, or most people have got a- access but when you drill down mm-hmm. and what's happened with the pandemic as an example a bit off the road is that they found that a lot of people a lot of children didn't actually have access to computers mm. A lot of people. That's that. That's all. Now. And then, if they did have a computer, there's two or three children. They only had one computer for the for the family, or may, maybe in internet and all the other gadgets cost about fifty pound a month. I I don't know. So some people couldn't afford the internet cost for the separate one for their child or whatever. So there is the diversity of the future of how younger people from different backgrounds will engage in arts and what is it worth to them you know when when we watch a film you know the, the film stories these days are speeded up and if you look on the talking pictures which is a channel on on freeview and they show all the old films from mm-hmm. england and uh, america there's much more in the script you know it's not bang 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 fighting it's so you 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 have to engage with the script and sort of take time to look at it so if, if you jump to say well will young people where arts is not a, a part of their daily life Will they go into a gallery and spend 20 minutes just looking at pictures? You know, it's it's just a dichotomy of where people are coming from. I mean, older people as well, if it isn't part of their schooling or it wasn't part of their growing up, they may go to a blockbuster of somebody puts in sort of like an exhibition of Disney Mm -hmm. uh, cartoons or they may go... To, to that i mean what, what one of the most brilliant things with, with arts is that you get somebody like david hockney mm-hmm. who is uh, well into his 80s so obviously doesn't need to to work and you and you have an exhibition at the ra and you know you get critics and maybe cri- cri- criticize the work but the, the fact is you get somebody like david hockney and 
all different types of people. They, they've heard of David Hockney. Mm-hmm. They may like the colours. They don't necessarily have to know the quality or whatever, but it brings people in. Yeah. We've, we've got, I suppose, Ronnie Wood does a lot of art for the Rolling Stones. And I know anybody listening is going to say he's only speaking about older people, but <laughs> I can get, I can drop a name. We can drop a name. Mm-hmm. Ed Shearing has done the artwork for his latest album. Mm-hmm. So Boyd, Boyd George does, does art. And you sometimes find that people who are good in one area of the creative fields uh, can also draw or, or paint or f- photography. Brian, Brian Adams is mm-hmm. a, a main photographer as well as his uh singing so if you can get main people who people know maybe for, from different worlds that people will engage you know we, you had the phenomena of harry potter mm-hmm. you know where people who didn't normally read books children who didn't normally families who didn't buy a book yeah you know you you had li- little mary and john screaming to mum and dad mum and dad mum must have this book what's his book we're gonna have a book in this house we're never having a book in this house mum i want a book i want a book and they and eventually lo and behold a book goes in the house yeah and it could be for every 20 people who get a book in the house you know one one or two or three can continue re- reading mm-hmm yeah, no, it's a very good point. And perhaps it is the same with a lot of art that sometimes people need that gateway or entry point to get in to become interested or to have exposure to it. And then even when you were talking about the exhibition with the kids in the area that did the project that was 16 and 17, even if some of their parents were really hesitant, like for their children, they might think, well, actually, no, I quite like doing this. So I want to keep doing more of this. But whether or not their parents are going to change how they view it, that's yeah, maybe a, a bit more difficult. Well, in in today's world, I think people in in all different professions. I mean, but we know it's in the arts world and the creative world have have more than one job because you, you you may not be able to sort of make a living from being creative, but I mean, you you could still have your work in an exhibition and then work in a, a completely different job, or sometimes within within the structure. One person is the creative, one person is bringing home the bread and butter, and then that changes, you know, so it's different strokes for sort of different folks. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think we've maybe worked, veered off into different angles, but is are there angles that I've missed out from the art side of it? No, I don't think no. so. I think it's all so relevant. It, it's completely free. Yeah, and I think, it, I think it's also makes sense as well for people to understand that just because you, you're not a full-time artist and living from your art, only a very small percentage of society eventually reaches that level or has that privilege really to be able to only do their art most people have to do a day job or some other activity to generate an income but that doesn't mean that you cannot still engage with your creative process with some form of artistic output and i guess achieve a level of fulfillment through that well we're we're in very exciting times in that if you say every situation is different and we 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 just can't deal with it people can pick holes in anything that people say but if if you can't you take gen, generalizing which is always a problem but if if you say well you can't make a living from from arts we're, we're in a, a, a situation or a wonderful situation where people put their work up on instagram they put their work up on Facebook, mm-hmm. TikTok, or other things that we don't even know are going to appear in the future. And people can see their work and people build up followings and and you work at it. So there is a springboard to, to be cre- creative in many, many ways. And maybe even the level, the basic level of working a computer mm-hmm. and working a phone is being creative you know all of a sudden you may not feel it but you may put your post your picture up and you're changing the content of the picture you're editing your own picture and who 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 thought you you would be able to do that it's all about encouraging people to i suppose go that step further and try a project that they don't know because if it doesn't succeed it doesn't matter. You know, mm-hmm. you've learned from it. And as as you learn in life, really, that the greater the problems, really, that, that, that you have, the greater the opportunity is, is there mm-hmm. to, to actually work. And you, of, you often hear about p- people who have succeeded 
you know, they, they've had their book turned down, they've had the galleries t- turned down, they've had this turned down, and then it happens. But I think if you keep your feet on the ground, depending on your individual living situation, you can do both. I mean, I'm very fortunate in that using the creativity to be involved in this wonderful arts world. But I certainly know that there is another world out there, completely different world out there. And I I try and bring, not as a Mother Teresa figure, I'll say that again, not as a Mother Teresa figure, but I I do see people sometimes they they need a bit of help or this, that and the other. Mm -hmm. And you can bring the two worlds. One area that we haven't, I, I don't know why we haven't talked about it, I suppose because it's the latest thing and this this is this is about art. And I am actually, we're Michael to Michael, which is very nice. If I can say Michael, we can say Michael and we'll never forget each other's name. That I am actually a unique person. You're looking at somebody who is unique in one aspect of the arts. What is that, Michael? Well, I am the first ever curator at sea. I'm curator exhibitions at sea for the spirit of adventure and the spirit of discovery, which are saga ships. They're both Mm -hmm. new and they're both bespoke boutique ships, which means that each part of the ship is unique. And it's like the fabrics, the the sofas, the rooms, the bars, they're, they're all kind of like different. And There's two site-specific galleries on the ships in the same area, and and it's called the the gallery on deck six on both ships. Mm -hmm. And I do the curation for that. And and although other cruise liners have sometimes galleries that sell art or they have art where the cabins are or where the spas are, whatever, no other company has got a curator. And also from a uh, a focus point, mm-hmm. so it's focused on British artists. So again, they the theme is they they want artists who are not particularly um, household names, and so it's engaging with passengers. For those of you who don't know Saga's company, you have to be fifty five or old. Older. <laughs> yeah, it's very well not heard of it. <laughs> yeah, you have to be fifty five or older to go on the ship. But it, it, it it's very interesting because I've, I've, I've obviously been on the cru- cruise ships and see how passengers, uh, in this particular instance, sort of maybe uh, older passengers mm-hmm. relate to art. And the, the, the wonderful thing about culture is that it doesn't have to be your taste to have a chat where one person would say, I like this, yeah. I don't like that, I don't un- I understand that. But it, it's wonderful to feel that sort of older people engaged in sort of different elements of culture. And there's no reason mm-hmm. to, I think that, uh, I'll be interested to see what, what you feel about this, because Michael, the other Michael is very, very young. And is that in today's society, a lot of people would say that they, t- culturally, that they mm. would talk down to older people. You can't show this, you can't do that. But what I've seen is the, you know, we, we haven't talked down to anybody. I haven't put anything controversial for the sake of being mm-hmm. co- controversial, but some of the abstraction, you know, like a sort of a Dave Bowman's artworks is like of a, the Battersea gas meter, I think it's called. I may have mm-hmm. got that name slightly wrong, but it's abstracted. You say, well, what is that sort of gas meter? But people are able to relate to new things. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you think that, that older people... I'll talk down to. I suppose I've not really given it a lot of thought, actually, whether or not they do. I mean, for me, I think it's just important to engage people's curiosity. and That's great. To see things maybe that you wouldn't see otherwise and to learn about them and broaden your horizons, for want of a better expression. But I've never thought that any people, I don't feel, need to be pandered to or to talk down to or, you know, changing it in a certain way. And I think sometimes... It's easier, or not necessarily easier, but I think it's sometimes just finding the right way of presenting something. And I know from hosting exhibitions at my own space that if you present them in a certain, with a certain language or present them in a certain way, that you're going to alienate audiences. But then you can talk to people at their level, I think, and you can talk to them as equals rather than saying, oh, you won't understand this, or this isn't something you would like. It's like maybe this is something you would like. You know, you can see something that is probably unexpected 
And I think that's the better way to bring people on board with whatever you're doing rather than alienating them by thinking that you're above their intellect. Yeah. I suppose I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in sort of, you know, what is the next step? I don't particularly un- un- understand AI in a sort of professional way, but I, I, I was certainly in- interested in the behaviour culturally and socially, how people relate to what's going on. And we touched on it uh, earlier. Mm-hmm. I, I feel that what you said is encapsulated kind of like what I think. So we're, we're on the same page as those politicians say, is that, in today's world, if there's something that you're curious about mm-hmm. or you're interested, you know, like you see a picture, a film, a sculpture, whatever, you don't necessarily you don't necessarily need to go out and buy the catalogue or whatever. It, 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 the first step is you go on your computer, your phone, and you can find out about whatever it is. You you can get an overview, and you can say, "Well, I'll follow that up. I'll I'll mm-hmm. get a, a book on that." And so it, it is a magical world that, that your c- curiosity can be satisfied because we've got the technology that is very in- inexpensive that you can you you can find out things now very easily and and sort of widen your knowledge your your cultural knowledge very very easily i hope you enjoyed listening to michael barnett's unique story and insights he shared regarding creativity and finding your own path We actually ended up speaking for another hour, which perhaps I can release at a later date as a bonus episode. So if you'd like to hear more from Michael, please let me know. I'll arrange to put out the additional material. As always, I've included links in the show notes to where you can connect with Michael Barnett online, as well as more about State F22 magazine and Arts Bermondsey Project Space Gallery. If you'd like to know more about this episode, have any questions, or would like to share feedback to this or previous episodes of the podcast, you're more than welcome to get in touch. Please follow Subtext and Discourse wherever you go for your podcast listening or do one better and leave us a review of the show. Thanks again for tuning in. My name is Michael Dooney and you've been listening to Subtext and Discourse.